<laughs> Welcome to Creative Careers. Thank you so much for watching today. Uh, we have some really great panelists, and we're going to talk about arts administration, how to manage your career. Uh, joining us today is Susie Medic, the Managing Director of Berkeley Repertory Theater in Berkeley, California. Uh, we also have Ted Russell from the Irvine Foundation, and Sarah Williams, uh, the Associate Managing Director and the Managing Director of the Ground Floor at Berkeley Rep. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions, and then we're going to open it up to questions on the internet. And uh, we're so happy you all could join us. So this is just a, a general question for everyone. Um, what's your current role at your organization, and uh, what are some of your responsibilities? How about we start with Sarah? Okay, I'll kick it off. Um, so I am the Associate Managing Director at Berkeley Repertory Theater. I also manage the Ground Floor Program, which is Berkeley Rep Center for the Creation and Development of New Work. Um, my job encompasses many different things, but what's really great about it is that um, I work with our Managing Director, Susie Medic, right here, and also with our General Management Team. I do various things. I work on commissioning new artists. Um, I work on contracts and agreements for our directors and our playwrights who we have working here in the season and I manage the ground floor program like I mentioned before which is really exciting because that just means working with a lot of new artists um, workshops and different readings and also our summer residency lab cool how about you, Ted? Yes, Ted Russell. I'm the Senior Program Officer for the Arts, the James Irvine Foundation, headquartered in San Francisco, California. And uh, on the surface, it looks like my job is all about making grants to arts organizations, but what I really do is create arts opportunity for the people in California. That's and awesome. <laughs> all right, right, and we do that via making grants to arts organizations, including Berkeley Rep, where we funded the ground floor, which has led Ooh. to some incredible work and plays <laughs> and has obvious impact. And uh, really, though, then to actually do the work, it's all about three stages of grant making. One is prospecting, finding the right candidates, and whether that's by invitation or whether it's seeking out a potential grantee that would do a certain thing. And then there's this very um, bureaucratic process of making the grants, and that's where being a program officer feels more like being an actual uh, loan officer or something, because we're making recommendations, but there's a lot of paperwork involved. And then lastly, once the grants are made, the checks go out, and then we monitor the work over the duration of the grant. And whether that's two years, three years, whatever length, there's interaction with the grantees, who are generally fabulous people. He has to come to our <laughs> shows sometimes. It's just awful. <laughs> right? And that is by far the best part of the job, once the grants are made. Uh, so I'm Susie Medock. I'm the Managing Director at Berkeley Repertory Theater, and in that capacity, I am hired by the Board of Directors to partner with our Artistic Director, Tony Ticcone. We've been working together for 26 years uh, and uh, in that time my responsibility I suppose the job has really changed a lot over the years but I'm ultimately responsible for the uh, well-being of the organization uh, Tony ostensibly is responsible for picking the Pro, the, the, the plays and the artists and charting an artistic course for the institution, uh, what we've realized is we both have to be concerned about what, what we're all involved with. And so I'm ostensibly responsible for our financial well-being, for our HR, human resources, for fundraising, for marketing, board relations, uh, facilities, uh, but we, we have we have to we have to be in it together so we're both involved with everything i uh, i would say in addition to all of that the the other thing that that is a particular aspect of this job that is not true in all places in the country and not in all arts organizations but i have a a function as sort of our external affairs person where i i am very involved in the community on behalf of the theater that's really really uh, fantastic uh to s kind of switch gears but stay in the same lane, what are some of like the challenges of each one of your positions, uh, things you face daily or overall for the arts organizations? What are things that you find uh, challenging? Well, I'll answer. Um, so I am relatively new to this position. I started here in June, and I would say one of the overall challenges of this job is that I'm learning something new every day. Um, I recently graduated from a graduate program, so this is my foray back into the working world of theater um, as a real working adult <laughs> again. And so 
every day is there's a new issue or challenge or a different way of having to think about a problem that we're currently grappling with. And so I feel like I'm constantly wrestling with uh, being finding creative solutions to things. Um, Oh, so I have to say, <laughs> so the interesting thing about my job is that it's new every single day <laughs> for 26 years. <laughs> and every day I'm cra drapple, you know, grappling with problems that weren't yesterday's problem. But <laughs> yes, awesome. it's so true. It's just so the nature of the beast. One of the cool things about working in theater management and administration is that you're and I think theater in general is that every day is new and you're always trying to you're always being challenged. It's never kind of a boring day to day everything is the same kind of job. Um, so that's a great thing and also can sometimes make your head hurt at night. <laughs> <laughs> and while things aren't really at the same type of pace at a foundation, we don't have new crews coming in, new directors, actors, etc., continuously changing. Things are a little more stable and yet the pace is relentless. So one of my greatest challenges really is just managing the workload and balancing things, especially because it's such a people business. So at the same time, I'm processing workloads, trying to stay up on all the latest research. I'm simultaneously trying to really manage relationships, get out there, see shows, see art exhibitions, and really be patient and as tactful as possible when getting involved in all these activities. I'd say the other part of it really is uh, the tough part is the judgment calls because unfortunately, we end up saying no a lot more often than we say yes. I probably have about 19 no's to every yes we make and uh, it's never easy to deliver that bad news. It kind of makes up for it on those happy days where you get to make a grant and call someone and say that great idea you have is something we can fund. Other times they're great ideas and having the judgment to decide for the foundation and based on what we're doing, which things we should fund that fit our strategy and help us meet our goals for serving California, that's actually in some ways the very toughest part of the job because you know you're saying no and yet you're really trying to focus on a strategy and fit what you should say yes for. You know, if I could just Please. sort of follow up on something that, that I think both of these guys have said, is that um, I think that, that there, are, um, there are fields in which management is considered sort of the number cruncher function of their organizations, and that um, what they want from you is to just keep the trains running on time. And I think that within arts organizations, and actually I think it's true of a lot of foundations as well, I think there, it's incumbent on you as a manager, as an administrator, as a leader, to be thinking creatively with the kind of with with your kind of brain. That I think that um, that that people tend to go, oh, you're an administrator or you're an artist, and I and I don't see it that way. I think that um, that that the thing that is a challenge for an administrator or for a uh, uh, any kind of arts leader is to be thinking creatively all the time about the thing that you're good at. And um, and because the problems are different all the time, you can't wake up today and go, well, I solved that problem yesterday. I now know how to solve it. I can solve it again today and tomorrow. Today's problems are going to be different than yesterday's were. You're, you have to constantly and vigilantly be thinking about how are you going to create an environment in which the artistic priorities of the organization are honored and supported and where you're creating the, 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 the pool of resources that are going to make them be able to be successful. And often that's not just a nice linear um, uh, 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 direction from point A to, to point B. There's lots of circuitous routes to get there. So you all are talking about the challenges and the circu circuitous routes to get there. What are some of the best parts, the things that make you happy in your job? Like, what do you really love doing in your job? Ooh, ooh, ooh I do love making those grant calls. That's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love getting them. <laughs> right? <laughs> and we've had some fun actually being like unperson and non-location and other great calls. And uh, obviously, that's one of the most exciting things you can do is to actually provide the resources and make the connections. But I also love the creative part in terms of, okay, how do we work on a strategy that's going to result in art that's in one case an innovation fund and how do we help large institutions 
innovate, well, a group like Berkeley Rep is really good at that, and they actually have a, a natural advantage in terms of the people here and the creativity of thinking, but other very large institutions move like large ships. So how do you design something that helps them be innovative, give them the supports to work in different ways? Similarly, when you're trying to help smaller organizations grow and institutionalize, and what they love is being mobile and nimble and doing so many different things, and you're helping them add the databases, the human resource systems, et cetera. And some of it sounds good on paper. If you're just in your management class, it's like, oh, well, you just do it like this. And yet the reality is it's all human behavior. It's all about doing things differently and changing. So coming from the foundation side and trying to design a strategy, it's like, how do we design this so then the people then have the reactions and get to where the organization needs to be Hopefully the organization grows, changes in different ways, and yet you're always thinking about the people and designing for that. So it's a creative challenge. I want to know what you, what you, what pleasure you're getting out of it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love theater, and I love the fact that I've found a way for my skills, what I can do well, to um, help make theater happen. So, like a lot of people, I got into this by just being in a, in a drama class when I was in third grade and then after that I was acting in plays and and doing theater in high school and I realized I didn't have the heart to be an actor per se but I loved this business so much that I wanted to find a way where I could still be really helpful and useful and um, arts administration and producing and and being an arts leader, that's a way that I found my skills to be really useful. So I get a lot of pleasure, kind of like what you were saying, Ted, about thinking about organizational culture and how do you make this business, which this artistic, wonderful endeavor, which also happens to be a business, actually successful, because it doesn't always seem like that's going to align necessarily, um, but it really can happen. And also just the chance to um, see people's words on stage. I mean, bringing to life the diversity of the world in which we live on our stages is really cool, and I get very excited to be a part of that. That's a, that's a really beautiful answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I heard in several different ways, each of you kind of talk a little bit about capacity uh, for organizations. Um, how do you broach capacity with mission statements how how do they intersect how are they used to influence the, uh, the path of the organization uh what just talk to us a little bit about mission statements I, i'd actually answer your question not first by talking about mission statement but by do? saying that that you know one of one of the things that we as as uh managers have to deal with a lot is physical reality that there are there are aspirations, there are ambitions, and then there's physical reality, and um, and it's not to say that we're the king and queens of of physical reality, but I do think that our task is to um, establish is to make sure that what the physical resources are that we've identified are deployed in a way that's consistent with our mission statement. And uh, even more than that, I'd say, that are deployed in a way that's consistent with the values of the organization. Because the values are the thing that actually sus is sustaining, mm -hmm. and the mission actually sometimes changes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if you're really clear about what your values are, then everything else falls into place. So is that sort of like uh, capacity and ambition where they both kind of meet with those values? Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is I think there's moments when you have, yeah, we, we are in the, we, artists make choices, administrators make choices. The, the nature of what theater, good theater is, is that people have made a lot of choices. It's what I love about tech rehearsals is sort of watching people make choice after choice after choice on stage. It's a thing that's, it's such a great reminder that it's all about choice making. Um, and, and I think that as, um, I, I think that, that 
maybe the interesting, one of the interesting things about what we do is figuring out how to help other people make the choices that are going to be good choices based on the resources that they have. And sometimes that does mean, it, it, it doesn't mean that you can't take risk, it doesn't mean that you don't take leaps of faith, but, but developing an informed sense of what is a wise, what, what is a reasonable risk versus what is an, an ir irresponsible risk is part of what sort of maturing as a manager, I think, is about. Yes, Susie. <laughs> I think so much of what you said is so right. I think um, a way that mission statements and core values can be really useful is that there's so many different solutions to problems or to issues and there's so many creative ways to go about solving something and there are a lot of really good and great ideas out there but having your core values, having a mission statement to fall back on as a guide, as a way to take out the good ideas, to separate the good ideas from the really great ideas. That's how I find mission statements and um, core values as a, as a tool, as a way to be useful, and in that sense, building capacity and, and finding ways to stay aligned by having something to fall back on as kind of a, a tool or a guide. That is so it, and I respond in part from my experience working at four different arts organizations along my path on the arts management side, as well as having a perspective at a foundation and encountering mission statements and spending a lot of time thinking about organizational capacity in order to uh, achieve uh, different goals, uh, actually pursue projects. And so what I've seen along the way is the great thing about a mission is it can really help align people in all aspects of this. And we call them stakeholders in the arts and management world, but really it's the staff, it's the volunteers, it's the board members, it's community members that you're talking to about resources and partnering with and having a clear mission statement that people are actually agreed upon helps you stay in alignment so you're actually moving the same direction because people all come into the activity into the enterprise for different reasons and so you have to keep aligning those because a Berkeley rep actually has a different mission than the theater next door. And literally, there is a theater next door here, the Aurora Theater, right? And you can think of it generally as all being theater and let's make the best theater possible, but it's aspects of the mission and this is why it's so important to refresh them, change them, make sure the key stakeholders are involved in that process because you really want to be aligned and then at some point it is helping you make some of these trade-offs. And I think the hardest part, and I still think of myself as an arts manager because I think it's such an important profession, part of the hardest part is when to say no, when to say yes. And uh, what my arts management guru and mentor taught me was that's the important thing. is like knowing how much risk you can afford at any given moment what you want to take the risk for and the mission should be part of that equation along of course with the bottom line and finances and the human capacity but the mission should help you decide how much risk to take you know would it be helpful would you like me to give a real example yeah i was actually about to follow <laughs> that up with how <laughs> risk capacity yeah. missions going along what's a tough decision you had to make in regard to something like that well uh, let me let me try to let me try it in a, in a different way because i was realizing we're talking platitudes and we all we all think they're great platitudes but that it might actually be helpful to 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 take something in particular. I was thinking about when I first came here, I came from a theater that had about a million and a half dollar budget, and at the time, our budget here was about three and a half million dollars. We're now at about 16 million. But I can remember leaving that, that small company and thinking, oh my God, it's gonna be such a relief to have more money. And I came for the interviews here, and what every member of the staff wanted to talk about was how we were, they were being asked to do too much with too little money. And I thought, it was just like there's more zeros. The, same, the problems are exactly the same. And for me, there was this sort of lesson in that there's no such thing as having enough money. You never have enough money. You're always in a position of having to prioritize. And so when I came here, I was thinking, God, this is so great, there's so much more money. And, um, and, and what I was being told was that um, the technical staff was so frustrated because there was just not enough money to be doing the things that they wanted to do. 
And the um, the board couldn't understand why they were frustrated by it when, having looked at the national surveys, we were spending just as much money as everybody else did. And I looked at what we were trying to accomplish, and I looked at the plays that we were doing, and as an outsider and without baggage, I was able to say, you know, it seems to me that you're trying to do the same thing that everybody else is doing financially, but actually you're, you want your productions to be much bigger. You want your productions to, um, to, um, to give artists um, more of what they're looking for. You want to be able to say yes to artists more often than, you, than, than say no, and that's going to cost more money. So your budget may not look like every other theater's budget. And if we're going to get out of this logjam... Maybe we have to redistribute more money into the physical production because every director, every designer who you're hiring wants a bigger palette. And that was a really uncomfortable initial conversation. But it was a way of trying to make our budget align with the aesthetic that was being charted by that artistic director at that time. And so we had to, there were things we had to not do. <laughs> Don't even ask me what they were any longer because I can't remember them. But I know that we made choices not to do them. I mean, does that, does yeah, that, that, that totally, I think, answers the question in a way that frames it um, very specifically. We talked about we talked about money. So money, all arts organizations, we need it. It's hard. Uh, it's hard to get it. It's lacking. What are some of the other problems you think arts organizations are facing right now? that managers and administrators are facing besides money. Those tough things well, are out there. Big ones. Since I'm primarily dealing with the money question, but then underneath that, you get underneath the hood and try to find out what people are trying to do and what they're struggling with. And I feel like at a high level, organizations are really now starting to look at diversity and they're changing communities and they're thinking bigger picture about relevancy. And mm -hmm. luckily there are institutions that are deeply tied to their communities like a Berkeley rep. But then I think tactically organizations are thinking, geez, we're doing all this work. And for some of them, it feels like it's an extra step to then connect to the community. So what I'm seeing people do is try to figure out where does that sit? Do we have a community engagement person? And do they connect with all these partners? And how does that work? But wait, if that person's here for a couple years and then they go away, do we lose all those relationships? Oh, we need more people on our board who think that way about the community. And then it's a longer step of, well, how do the people we know on the board bring in other people who are more inclined to do that or connected with different parts of the community? And that's a challenge because now they're doing something new. And then in some cases, the idea is, well, if we want to engage the community, that should be distributed more across the staff. And whether there's a department or more people are taking up that charge and going out in the community, doing some of the things like Susie does that other people may do in outreach, maybe you have more people on staff take the time, add to their jobs, and go out and do it. So this is the kind of thing I see people struggling with that you can see from the higher level of how does an institution connect with the community but then internally, it's really like, how does that change someone's job? What does it get added to? And what, if anything, might come off the plate? I think those are all real issues, Ted. There's no question about it. I think they're connected to another and, and equally, maybe for me, even more troubling um, uh, issue that's dangling out there just in the last two, three days, I read in some, ooh, what was the source? I read uh, that uh, in 21 or 26 states, there is a, an initiative underfoot to reduce scholarships and reduce funding for kids who go into the humanities in public, in universities, and to try to increase the incentive for kids to participate, um, young people, to, um, to go into engineering and into the sciences. And the devaluation of the humanities, the devaluation of liberal arts, the devaluation of the role of, of, of um, not just arts and culture, but creativity that is not tied to commercialism uh, is, is something that I feel is the huge existential threat 
to the arts in this country, it filters down into interesting ways. It filters down into declining funding from foundations, from corporations, and even from some individuals. It places increased dependence on on individual donors, so um, and 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 reduces sort of the democratization of philanthropy because. Um, more and more philanthropic dollars come from fewer and fewer people for the arts, which um, which is not a good thing. For so many years, we had so much so much individual money coming from so many more places, and um, and it places an increasing burden on us for uh, building a case for something that we didn't used to have to build a case for. And so um, now, and I don't say that to discourage you because I actually, I firmly believe that there will continue and always be a, um, a, a, a value placed on culture in, in this country. But, um, but, it's, but it's, a, it's an environment that is requiring that we be savvier, that we be, um, that we be much more articulate about, about the arguments that we're making. That's terrifying. I'm sorry. <laughs> These are some I've, really I've big issues. I've always believed that my theater um, and drama background and education has prepared me for life in a way that my colleagues who have gone into business or who have gone into the sciences just are not prepared, actually. And that because I have this background in communicating and working with people and thinking creatively, I could actually do anything that I wanted. Um, and I choose to do theater because I love it. But that's a kind of terrifying um, and sobering moment. Thanks, Susie. No, I'm so sorry. But I, uh, I will add just... Um, Keep it real. Thank you, Susie. Appreciate <laughs> that. Another issue that I've been thinking about is um, I think how we communicate and how we tell stories is changing. And so I think uh, an issue of my generation of theater makers that we're going to be facing is how we've structured our organizations or how we bring theater to the people is going to have to be different because people want to receive it in a different way. So what does that mean? Does that mean that um, we change kind of the traditional theatrical outing that maybe what you're seeing on stage is that there are different technological elements involved. I just think that we're at a moment in time now where we're going to be seeing a kind of shift and what it means to go to the theater, um, and I think that's pretty exciting, and a shift in how we make theater. People are doing things very differently. People are collaborating with people from all different backgrounds and all different areas, and I think that's really exciting, but it just means how we do it, how we fund it, what we're doing is all gonna look really different, and so that's exciting. And what stories we're telling. And what stories yeah, we're telling. It is, it's really exciting. Yeah. yeah we're, we're sort of talking about a little a paradigm shift, uh, actually, and with the engage, community engagement, the diversity, and then education, all things we, <laughs> each one of you hit on separately, it, it sounds like the entire landscape has to change or has to adapt to keep up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thinking about some of those things. But when you think about the, the you know, the, the theater has been has been part of how humans interact since the beginning of time and uh, and certainly for the last 2500 years even when there's been a more formal theatrical structure than pure storytelling around a campfire uh, the form has changed it's changed over and over and over again and if there's one thing that i think we can say about this field it's that um is that it's been nothing if not adaptive <laughs> agreed Wow. We always find a way to tell our stories. <laughs> right? And this is where the creative tension is right now. I think we're in some of the juiciest part of the conversation because now you have institutions that have grown, especially the larger regional theaters, over decades, and the audiences have aged, the, the theaters have matured. But now you have this creative tension between, wait a second, literally some of our best donors are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and literally you start wondering, well, can people still attend? Can they still come? And you have this tension between what's really now the crux of the organization, the main donors, the people that in some ways you need to please as your audience the most, and yet you have young people in your community, can you reach them? Are you gonna tell the stories that they wanna hear at the same time as you keep this older audience, and yet just appeal to the younger folks and 
they don't have the capacity necessarily to give. And then you look at some of the generational change where you have a generation where so many people didn't really get arts education. And I hear conversation after conversation say, we should be able to reach these tech people. We should be able to reach Silicon Valley. All these people are in San Francisco now, but some of them don't have that fundamental love or interest in the arts because it may not have been stoked for them while they were in school. And if they are in the arts, they may be looking for something new in theater. They may be someone who's involved in uh, data or user interface design, and they're looking for creativity. So ultimately, theater, arts administrators, people making the art have to creatively think about their audiences and then hopefully with the pure creativity of what stories do we want to tell, how do we want to tell them, what range of things can we offer, how do we then balance the people we want to reach with the money we need to get from them or other people to sustain all this and to have it grow. So it's, you're really at the crux of a lot of the issues here. Yep. Balance and sustainability, it's really, really big. I was going to say, one of, some of my favorite conversations with, with audience members are the people who call and they go, how could you have done that play? How could you have done that? And, uh, and, and I've said on any number of occasions, I bet you're one of those people who has at one time or another said to us, you'd like to see more young people in the theater. And I say, if you want to see young people in the theater, then you have to be willing to see work that they're interested in. And at the same time, we all have to hope that they will also be willing to see the work that you're interested in. But ultimately, we're going to all be healthier if we are a multi-generational experience. And that means a lot of generosity on both sides. But I love you. As soon as you say that to them, we go, oh, you're right. <laughs> oh, you're right. <laughs> but somebody has to call them on it, you know, and it goes both ways. Goes both ways. So, in, I'm going to pivot just a little bit, uh, in, but still stay in that lane because Ted, you brought up engagement and diversity, and we talked a little bit about theater education. And looking at this panel, we're this is you all are super diverse, and that, that diversity thing you mentioned that hot word uh, a little bit while ago. Thinking about the next generation of theater makers and or this current generation of theater makers and diversity and inclusion efforts, especially in arts administration looking at small and large organizations, what are some of those things that we can do as administrators to diversify the current workforce? Uh, I, I'm in community engagement and education, and most of the kids that I see right now, they all want to be actors. What can we do to show them, or what's out there right now to well, help them access that? I know that I try to talk about what I do all the time um, to all sorts of people, because I know that when I was thinking about my future when I was about to graduate from college, I didn't even really realize that arts administration was something that I could do or that I could make a career out of. And so that was a wonderful realization for me when I realized that. And I think had I known that earlier, perhaps I would have done thing, something different or taken maybe a little bit of a different path to, to bolster you know the experiences that I had in order to kind of make my way down this career path that I chose so I know like something like this when I'm asked to speak on a panel or any time that I can talk to um, students who are interested in theater I try to talk about what I do um, just as a way to put it out there because if you don't know that this exists then how will we be able to reach a variety of different people. Um, so that's one thing I like to do. Um, and another thing that I think is important in the the conversations about equity and diversity is in, and inclusion is a willingness, especially for organizations that exist already that are looking to become, to be more diverse in you know every area, every part of their organization is um, to be willing to accept that it's not going to be an easy path and that it's going to create disruption. And I think accepting that will allow, will allow you to create different policies, to have different procedures, to be very intentional about what you're trying to do. If you, if you make that decision that this isn't just going to be smooth sailing, this isn't just programming a different type of show, this means that we're gonna program a different type of show and we're gonna reach out to this type of audience and we're gonna have these policies and procedures for hiring and it's gonna be weird and uncomfortable maybe for our staff, but we're ready to go there. And I think inten intention is a really, a really important part of that conversation. 
Yeah, I'm so fascinated by the question because the key thing here to me is if you look at the younger generation in the United States and California, it's more diverse. It's going to be more diverse. All the arts theater are going to be more diverse. And yet you have this issue about how welcome are people, what type of opportunities do they get? And we look at arts administration. There was recently a study in New York City looking at the composition of the arts administrators of the nonprofits versus the community. And the disparity is kind of mind blowing. But there are people who understand that we have to foster the next generation. It's about mentoring. It's about making opportunities, making sure diverse people at least have the opportunity to pursue those things. So that's one key step. But on the other side, the doors aren't always opened up for you wide open. And let's face it, these are competitive fields. People want to be in the arts. It's the dream that people have held for most of their lives, for all their lives, for decades, and then the gates get narrower and narrower. So my advice, no matter how open the doors are or not, is just to work, work, work. And if you're creating the art, make as much as you can. If you're on the administrative side, also, uh, with whatever role you have as a staffer, try to volunteer some, try to pick up experience. Reach out to older people and look for mentorship. And the key to mentorship is being able to ask smart questions. You can't just go up to the really smart person you work with or who you admire and just look at them glowingly and say, I love your work because people are looking for a dialogue. But I also find that over my career on both sides of it, when you reach out to people and you have an affinity, and on my end now connecting with more people who are interested in the work, whether as a funder or in arts administration in general, when you see people who are eager and smart and have great questions, of course you want to answer some of those questions. So I think uh, it's incumbent on the diverse generation coming up, no matter how much the doors are open or not, and hopefully there are mentors out there just to pursue your career as strong as you can, because that's the key to making it happen. I have a, a couple of thoughts. Please. Uh, first of all, I, you know, when I went into this field, um, there weren't there weren't many women in top leadership positions, and I think the reason that I ended up making the choice to make this my career was because there was one woman, and I could see that she was doing it, and knowing that someone had done it made it possible for me to imagine that I could do it too, and I think that's true for any anybody coming up. You have to be able to see somebody else like you in that position to be able to imagine that you could be sitting in that seat too. And so we need to get more people into these seats so that somebody who is 14 or 16 or 18 or 20 can imagine that they could be sitting in that seat too. And to that end, um, I think that there's a couple of things I, I could, well, actually, there's one other point I'd like to make, which is that we still see uh, among the, the people who we are recruiting for uh, either our fellowships or for jobs, that um, there is, a, there is a, a, a real fear on the part of many parents that um, that this is not a good career choice for their children. And if their kid is a first generation or second generation college educated kid, there's a lot of parental pressure to go into something other than the arts. And so we have a task, I think, ahead of us to um, to make sure that parents understand that these are actually, these are good jobs. These are stable jobs. These are jobs in which your child can have a very fulfilling uh, professional life, and um, and that's a challenge that as a field I think we haven't figured out how to communicate because we've seen people drop out and 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 switch uh, ambitions because there was so much parental pressure, family pressure to do something else. So that that that's just another point. Having said that, there are actually a few things that 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 anybody who's who's watching this uh, panel I hope would be aware of first of all um, the commercial theater producers in um, in New York the the League of, Pro of producing theaters have actually started a fellowship program that's about 10 weeks long which is geared toward people who traditionally have not chosen um, administrative positions before the League of Resident theaters which is the 75 largest theaters in the country are actually in the process of trying to put together a fellowship program that would be um, that would be feeding future, uh, arts management leaders into their theaters. In addition to that, 
Uh, there are a number of uh, theaters around the country, and, and LORT, the League of Resident Theaters, L-O-R-T, actually has a website with a list of all of their theaters, and many of them have fellowship programs. And the point are internships, fellowships. The point of those programs is to put somebody who hasn't had experience in a professional environment into their organization so somebody can actually experience what um, uh, what it feels like to be working in a professional company and can develop the portfolio, the resume references, the sponsor, the mentor, who is going to help them uh, make a great career. And so you should you, you, people people should know about those resources. Yeah, and talking about career paths, and everyone's path is different. Uh, as we start to kind of wrap up things, what are some things you would encourage a person to pursue uh, if they were looking to get into a, a career such as yours? Wow, that's a toughie. Um, I think it's really about opportunity and finding it wherever you can. So for me, I started as a visual artist. I ended up primarily working in performing arts institutions. I was fortunate enough to hear about a position in philanthropy and do my best to fill it. And the main reason I was qualified to do my job as a senior program officer is that I had worked in various art forms. So it turns out what I was willing to do to pursue the jobs and find the best opportunities I could ended up really paying off for me later in my career. And sometimes I intentionally took jobs where I would build skills where I wasn't as strong, thinking about the long term of my career, and I intentionally took a fundraising job, a development job, because that wasn't my strongest suit, and did the hard work of that took a job managing a small dance company where I had to do everything but take out the trash in order to learn all these various dimensions of the work. And so I think some of it is how do you pursue opportunities and how do you think about making yourself stronger for the next job and the job after that? That's great advice. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's so much better than just the kind of typical go get an internship or fellowship and I think while that will offer you so much in terms of the value one gets out of that I think there are ways to find opportunities in everything that you do. Um, I would also just add if this is a field that interests you to go see theater. Um, there's I think sometimes we get wrapped up in the career path of building my future and we forget about why we love this field. And so any opportunity you have to go see theater, see plays, be able to talk about why you like plays or why you don't, um, being able to converse about issues in the field and, and what you're reading and why art is vibrant and important, I think are is, it's a huge part of what I do. I'm trying to be better at it every day and so I try to go see a lot of shows and I try to read more plays and know what's happening in the field because um, that's only going to help you be stronger and and kind of affirm why this business and this this thing called art is so wonderful. I think you're so right because the only reason to do this is because you love you love the work. Otherwise, there's not much that's very gratifying about it. Really, it, it's about the work. But having said that, I, I think that there's a couple of other things I'd add. One is that um, the more you, uh, the better an education you get. I think the more tools you're going to have. I think that the um, the better your critical thinking skills are the better a manager you're going to be. And then the other thing is that this is totally a people business. This is what 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 all of the arts are is about people. And so you you spend your whole life trying to meet people and to develop real meaningful relationships, relationships in which you learn from each other, relationships in which you have an opportunity to see how you want to behave in, in the work world. Um, but but it's all about people. It's really, really great advice from all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to transition a little bit to some questions we got from the internet. We've got one from Riviana from Oakland, California. She's a student at Mills and ACT. What were some of your professional goals when you were younger or currently? How did they evolve? And what are some goals now? How about Sarah? So my ultimate goal right now um, at this point in my life is I want to be a managing director of a theater company, a large theater company that is something I've set my heart on and so that is the, the career path that I'm following currently um, and 
what was the rest of that uh, question? Uh, d- evolution. How did it anything oh, evolve? Um, yeah. So I, like I said, I discovered that arts administration was a thing in college right before I graduated. And I had a wonderful mentor at Boston College, John Houchin, who kind of took me under his wing. And from there, I did an internship with the Huntington. And I learned that I was terrible at production management. So that was really helpful to find out that that was not something that I <laughs> probably wanted to pursue. And then I was able to work for the Huntington Theater Company. And I think working at a theater company was really was really great for me because it helped me identify what my skills were that, um, the skills that I had that I was, let me rephrase. It helped me uh, realize the skill set that I had to be a good manager and that that was something that I wanted to do. And so from there I was able to kind of build my five, 10 year plan. And I, in my plan, I decided that grad school was important to me and was going to be helpful for me. So I went to a graduate program and now I'm here at Berkeley Rep as the Associate Managing Director with um, my eyes on the future for that Managing Director gig. Watch out, Susie. I'm so ready for you to take it. <laughs> well, Susie, what were some of your goals when you were starting out? Uh, when I started out is I wanted a job. <laughs> I wanted to be employed. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I think initially I just knew that um, I wanted to be in the theater. I knew that I wasn't. I was a perfectly adequate actress, and and was blessed to discover, as Sarah did, that I actually had a skill set that could be much more meaningful to the field. And I think very quickly my sort of um, my uber vision <laughs> was I wanted to have impact, and I think that that's really been the the driving factor for me throughout my entire career. If I'm going to put the energy into this, I want to feel like I'm making a difference. I want to be able to look back at some point and say something was different because I was here. And along the way, I discovered that it was really important to me that the work be good, that I wasn't willing to work in a company where the work was mediocre, um, and that I had something to do with whether it was going to be good or bad. Um, but I, but I think, I think, and, and I, I also, I guess, discovered that what I really loved was creating an environment where other people could excel and where other people could learn and where we placed value on people learning. And so when I think about what impact I've had, one of the impacts I feel is that we've created a theater where people feel that they're encouraged to excel. I would like to think that's true. That's great. How about you, Ted? Yeah, I can sum it up pretty quickly because I'll skip the first part where I wanted to be a great mechanical engineer (laughs) because luckily that morphed into me wanting to be a sculptor and got better and better at that. And then I wanted to put on exhibitions so more people could see my work and the work of my friends. And that involved me finding out about arts management and getting an MBA in arts management and then really pursuing that, wanting to be a great arts manager And then luckily I focused and found a niche in that where it was all about marketing, getting more people to see the art. How do we get the community and people who aren't always part of it to be in and making it be more about more diverse aspects of community. And then luckily enough, finding the opportunity to be in philanthropy, then saying, oh wait, how do we actually benefit the entire community really in line with what you're saying, Susie, in terms of benefiting the community using the art, great art that can connect us all. So now that's my dream and goal is really creating that community connection and having us evolve a little bit as a species if that's not too much to reach for. Oh, that's really cool. Those are really wonderful answers. Um, we're going to bring up Jamie Ewan Shore. She is our education fellow at the Berkeley Rep School of Theater. She has a few more questions from the internet. We're going to take a couple and uh, wrap things up. If you have any questions that you'd like to contribute, please tweet to the hashtag creative careers. And I also, just to Susie's point, on the Creative Careers website, which is berkeleyrep.org slash creative careers, we have a list of all the Lort theaters that offer fellowships, internships, and apprenticeships, as well as their job openings. So it's a great tool. Go, again, it's berkeleyrep.org slash creative careers. Um, so this is a question from Kat in Westport, Connecticut. Um, Kat says, I manage several early career theater administrators, but have no professional development budget to to speak of. What are some free slash cheap suggestions for helping entry level professionals build skills and connections without switching jobs every two to three years? It's a deep question. It's a big one. Professional development. 
you know, if you're in Connecticut, there are some wonderful arts organizations there. And it would seem to me that if you could, if you can create even part-time fellowships, internships with any of those arts organizations, there's an opportunity for somebody to um, expand on what it is that they're learning academically and uh, give them access to people who are really good. Connecticut is, has, has fantastic arts organizations. Yeah. And like the Arts and Ideas, the International Festival of Arts and Ideas every year in New Haven, they always need tons of people to make that thing run. Um, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, there are some some online resources. I, I don't know that, I I don't know, I, I don't know about about um, all of them because I haven't looked at them in a long time. But for instance, um, if if uh, you can afford to to be and if you're a member to be able to send your your students to the East Coast TCG conference, this is a great way to open their eyes just to what is going on in the field. Um, I think that uh, something else that, you know, I think about there are online classes that I've taken or, or that our staff has taken. There's online resources in, um, in HR, in, um, there's fundraising um, uh, programs that you can study online that, so that there, there, there's some targeted programs, but I, I still think being able to be in a building with people who are doing is about the best education you can get. That may not be very helpful. I, I hope it was. Uh, Jamie, do you have any other questions? This is a question from Leah at Whittier College, and Leah asks, I work with a number of students who are designing their own majors instead of going through traditional degree um, in th degrees in theater and business. What advice would you give students integrating a number of areas of study in terms of searching for internships and entry-level positions? And also, what kind of classes do you think are actually super beneficial to administrative careers that you might not think are? My law and the arts class has proven to be extremely useful in the position that I'm in now. I deal a lot with contracts and contracting language and the amount of legality that surrounds putting on a production is something that I think can be hidden from view and um, my position deals with that often. So my law and the arts class, any, any kind of legal law coursework that you can do is extremely helpful and useful. And in that vein, human resources, organizational behavior, um, real estate law real estate. is another one that is really, no matter how small or big the organization, they deal with it. Um, um, you know, there's a lot of terrible marketing classes out there, but um, to have some understanding of what the, what the vocabulary is of marketing, is useful and how to read data, how to understand data. Um, I think that 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 you know those those would be some of them that come to mind. And a basic financial Amen. management yeah. class is yes. also very very useful. Yes. And I would say um, a, this is going to sound very general, but a class in leadership or either reading books, you know, reading those books on the like Harvard Business Review top twenty bestsellers. I've actually been so inspired reading books that are kind of geared toward the for-profit um, yeah. leadership sector, but that have been so useful and so interesting to think about how to implement that in a nonprofit creative environment. Yeah, and if you're in one art form, please look at other art yes. forms. You can mm -hmm. find other inspiration. So many artists obviously do. So just to be conversant in more than the one thing that you're most passionate about, it's really helpful. You know, there's, there's something else, which is that there's a lot of people who learn management skills. And there's, you can learn how to supervise. You can learn how to, um, you know, provide direction and feedback and all of that sort of thing. But I think that there's a huge difference between managing and leading. And any time that you can take a class or read a book or observe someone who is uh, who's who's exhibiting leadership? That is something that whether you end up being a leader or not, you can be a managing. It, 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 it's it is um, it is an experience worth having, and um, and it and it's 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 the thing that's probably hardest to teach. 
That's really great. Thank you. I think we should end on that note. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you to, so much to our panel. Uh, as Jamie said, it is fellowship season, so if you are an aspiring arts administrator looking for a fellowship or an internship, please go to the berkeleyrep.org. Uh, School of Theater, Creative Careers. We've got a nice long list of all the open internships and fellowships uh, with a lot of uh, useful resources as well uh, to help you apply for that job, resume tips as well. So please, please, please check us out. BerkeleyRep.org, School of Theater, Creative Careers. Thank you very much. And thank you to our sponsor, American Express. Uh, have a great evening. Thank you.